Hello, welcome back. It's about time I tied up this guide here so that you can all have working vest boards as the cold season passes. Being a northeast bound maniac myself, my days of riding are unfortunately over. The best I can do is utilize some of the time stuck inside to finally finish this. Welcome to the second installment of the Vesk Pint Project. I just want to say that I, well, I am quite surprised on the reach I was able to acquire already. It really got rid of the feeling that I had all this time that my efforts would eventually be all for nothing. It's really a challenge taking your first steps into a space this large, with the expectations of so many people, making you think that you're not worth their attention. But you all changed that. Now I'm gonna finish what I started. Where we left off, we should have the power side complete, the controller ready for installation, and the motor connector cured. The next step is to confirm whether our U-Box 75 actually powers on. Here is all the included hardware that will come with your U-Box. From the bag, you will want to source your BLE module and your power switch. You may notice that the input cable terminates with a larger connector than the one found inside the one wheel. This is an XT90 connector. This is installed because while by specification this VESC can support a 100 amp draw, we will just be limiting it in the firmware to draw only what is safe for the pack that we have here, which is totally fine for an XT60 connector to handle. So you can just remove this by desoldering. Quickly, I'll go over desoldering one of these rather large connectors. Uh, you saw me remove the small plastic shield over the now exposed solder connections. I'll take my iron, move things around a bit, and clean it off. Now we can take our U-Box and rig it up here so it's easy to work on. Then I will apply a small amount of solder to the tip, this will help create an initial thermal bond that will help me heat the wire a bit faster. You can see that the heat wicks up the wire fairly fast. Try not to burn your fingers. We will then switch to the negative wire and do the same thing. And there you have it. A freshly salvaged XT90 you can, uh, you can use on something. For the next step, we're going to take a genuine XT60 and, pro tip, if you take a female XT60 and connect these two together, we can avoid the pins shifting around in case we melt the plastic. Having the other hold the pins in place keeps that from happening. Right here I'm just sort of trying to knock off the extra solder off the tips of the wires uh, in order to get them to fit properly in the XT60. I'm using a really cheap Amazon solder sucker to kind of pull solder out of the threads and it seems to be working. With that out of the way, I made sure to place heat shrink onto the wires and forgot to, uh... I f did it again! I f did it again! <laughs> no! No! I'm not gonna say it was me. But I, I, I may have done the thing again. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> let me shrink some here. So, first that, then these. I want to place some of these up as far as I can go. Well, that was embarrassing. Anyway, I forgot to mention the polarity. The flat side represents the positive end, and we will solder the red wire to it. The negative side features a rounded or angled exterior. There are also markings on the sides of the connector in case you forget. Make extra sure you are following the proper orientation. Our controller is now compatible with the powertrain of the board. Now we can connect the necessary components in order to get this thing booted. We will start by plugging in the Bluetooth module. This allows connection to the phone and is inserted into the general comms port of the U-Box. Next, we will install the switch. This will toggle on and off the U-Box, as well as provide a debug LED that will flash codes for troubleshooting. 
You can now connect power to the controller, but I wouldn't exactly do it like this. Let's see why. What you just witnessed is a reverse polarity short on the battery. Now in this specific situation, the fault was actually due to the XC60 being installed backwards on the controller. If you follow my steps prior, you will not run into this issue. The reason my setup here is also incorrect is because of a design choice made by Future Motion. For some reason, and I'm sure this is due to the convenience of the BMS design or whatever, the batteries found in the one wheel Pint, Pint X, XR, and GT have their connectors wired in reverse on the battery. Meaning, if you aren't paying attention and accidentally plug one of these into any correctly wired device, you will have a very bad day. The rule of thumb when working on one wheels is to follow the colors. Red is positive, black is negative. So long as you match the colors, you will not run into this issue. Regardless, I recommend usage of a multimeter to be extra extra sure before making any connections. As for a friend here, the spark should have been a dead giveaway as soon as the connector made contact. Our unlucky builder here decided to commit and it ended up severely damaging the connectors and likely didn't fare well for the battery. However, even with this catastrophic event, both the battery and controller actually ended up working out in the end, and they still work to this day. Now we are ready to download the Vest Tool app on our phone. There are apps available on your respective app stores. I recommend purchasing, as it really does help the development of the application, but also the firmwares that your Vest board's gonna run. But if you do insist, there is a free APK you can download on the Vest Tool website for Android. Let's go ahead and plug the U-Box into the harness. Remember to follow the colors. You will likely hear a small audible spark this is due to the capacitors charging up initially, so there's a large inrush of current. You should see a device pop up on the vest tool. If not, check to make sure that your Bluetooth is on. If that doesn't work, see if flipping the UART, TX, and RX pins ends up fixing it. Some of these models were shipped with the pins flipped. Congratulations, your VESC is able to boot. So now that we know that our U-Box is working, we can continue with the rest of the project. The last thing we need to take care of is the foot pad connector. Now luckily this part here is available to purchase on DigiKey for a reasonable price, so we don't need to fabricate something ourselves. The only slight difficulty is wiring up the pull down resistors. So why do we need pull down resistors? Pull down resistors are required to make sure that any residual electrical charges, too small to be considered an activated pad, don't accumulate and create a situation where the ADC becomes charged. The pull-down resistors dump the tiny leak or noise to the ground. I went ahead and did a little experiment using one of the U-boxes I took out of a board. This harness I made features a grounding connection I can easily pull off in order to showcase what happens when there is no pull-down. You can see that as I press the pads, they peak at around 3.4 volts, and when depressed, they go all the way to zero volts. Let's unplug the grounding connection and try that again. Honestly, the results aren't as bad as I was expecting but there is a significant amount of residual charge bleeding through the foot pad. As you can see, it's around 0.68 volts. Now, while that's not really enough to trigger a ghosting situation, it's certainly not ideal, and any other foot pad that might have a defect or irregularity would definitely cause this value to be much higher. Here's the wiring diagram. You can see that we apply the 3V3 pin to the center tap of the foot pads. When the sensor is activated, it bridges the center tap to either side of the output pins. These then hit the ADC ports, and they register a voltage increase. After the pads are depressed, the remaining charge is dumped through the pull-down resistors, and the ADC should result in a voltage of zero. Some pads are more leaky than others, and water ingress can cause these values to rise as well. This is the case in stock one wheels too. 
Let's begin by collecting the included 3 and 8 pin JST connectors, two resistors from 1 to 10K, a pair of tweezers, and the included BLE module. Basically the goal here is to add pins to this JST connector, taking them from the other 8 pin JST. We will then use the 3 pin JST to provide our singular grounding connection. I'll start by prying up gently on the plastic lever and pulling three of the pins out. I then inserted the pins into where the 3v3, ADC1, and ADC2 pins should be. After this is done, I went ahead and lined up the wires in order to cut them to the appropriate length. You don't necessarily need to do this, but it makes the installation much cleaner. Since we will be bending these wires 90 degrees, I made sure to account for the difference in length from the shortest and longest path. I got the values of 145mm for the longest, 140mm, and 135mm for the shortest wire. Let's plug this repinned JST into the U-Box. This makes it a bit easier to work on when we wire up the pulldowns. I'll start by training the wires a little bit so that they are facing the general direction where the connector will be installed inside the casing. That would be up and around the corner towards the motor phase output side. I am then going to create a gap in the wire to create a junction point where I will be splitting off the two 4.7 kilo ohm resistors. I'll simply wrap a few turns of the resistors leads around the bare wire and cut off the excess. Then I solder the joint, making a very strong, reliable connection. I'll then take some heat shrink tubes and slide them over each resistor. I kind of like the look of clear heat shrink, especially with these resistors. As for the grounding connection, you can see that I have already removed the extra pins from the 3 pin JST and plugged it into the 12 volt rail header. I also cut it short in preparation. I'll go ahead and twist the exposed resistor leads together. Remember to add your heat shrink tubing before you bond the wires together. Let's take a look at the rear side of the foot pack connector I already have wired up here. Take note of the A marking on the top of the connector. We will use this for our orientation. On the bottom left pin, we inject our 3v3 signal into the connector. Then when the foot pads are activated, the 3v3 signal gets bridged to the two right side pins. We are going to solder the 3v3 wire to the left side pin, and then the two ADC pins are wired to the right side. It doesn't matter which ADC goes to which pad, as the functions of the foot pad are symmetrical. And there you have it. The foot pad harness is ready to be installed. Now we can move on to actually properly install the U-Box into the enclosure. I'm sure some of you might be wondering why the second installment took me so long. Well, this is why. I've been messing around with how I should go about building these things and came across a new method to mount this particular vesk inside this pint enclosure. I came up with this and had to reshoot everything after last video, so this is what I'm calling flip frames. A few key advantages to this approach are pretty substantial. The heat transfer to the lid is much, much better than the old style. We also have better access to the USB-C port. The wire routing is also much cleaner, with less overstrained paths. We also have a very convenient space behind the U-Box now to mount other peripherals. You can find the printable STL on my Thingiverse page. Be sure to post your prints on there too, as I love looking at what you guys come up with. Already, there are some really cool looking setups based on this, and I'm really excited to see what you guys make. After you print the flip frame, place it inside the controller housing. The holes line up with the factory standoffs, and we will use the same screws to lock it in place. Let's disconnect the BLE module from the harness and press it into its dedicated slot. You might have the Type 2 BLE module, and I will be releasing a modified frame for this specifically. Next, we will plug the harness into the BLE and insert the connector. Now we can drop the U-Box into the cutout. This should be a loose fit. 
I'll insert the motor connector here and secure it, as well as the foot pad connector with their respective nuts. Then we plug the foot pad harness with its grounding plug into the U-box, followed by connecting the main power. Remember to be prepared for the tiny spark. I also went ahead and printed this spacer for the included switch. I'll have a few different spacers available for positioning the switch more or less flush with the rails. Reason being that I have to make sure that the back of the switch doesn't collide with the controller. Let's then plug the switch in and turn it on. Excellent, our controller survived the install. Now we can close up our controller box. One note, and I mentioned this in the previous video, but I wanted to make sure everyone knew about the solution for getting this stupid O-ring to stay in the groove. Because trust me when I say, these things are an absolute nightmare. Before, I would constantly get these things pinched or be completely unable to get them back in because for some reason they expand over time. So what I do is simply go around with this super glue and pin down the o-ring in key locations. Just a small drop and then holding the o-ring there for about a minute keeps it in place and allows me to do general maintenance later without worrying about this stupid thing. Alright, another thing I have to go back and correct is something from the last video. You may have realized by now that nowhere in these videos have I mentioned a fuse. Now, that's not because I don't think you should have one, but at the time I, well, forgot. But now that I think about it, I didn't really have a good solution either. Before I would try using fuses harvested off of the fuses that come with the U-Box. The big PCB ones with the XT90s that are way too big to use. Anyway, after having one of my own fuses become cracked over time, I moved over to the blade style automotive fuses, which worked but were kind of an awkward thing to mount. Then some genius came in and asked me what I thought of his solution, and I was baffled that I never thought to place the ceramic surface mount fuses on the BMS as a replacement for the charge only bypass mod. Now I haven't personally used this approach, but I don't see a reason why it wouldn't be perfect. Now granted, if you end up causing a short circuit with this configuration, your BMS will be exposed to the short as well, and will have to try and protect itself. So in a way, this isn't a perfect solution either, as mounting the fuse lower down the chain would protect the BMS from possible shorts. But I think this method is pretty convenient. And of course, if you think that the BMS is worth being protected, then you can definitely use a different solution. Or run without a fuse at all, though I think that sounds a bit dangerous too. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's reconstruct the one wheel. Oh, we have pint that work. We have pint that work. Kaboom. Now I know, I know, this is the end of the video, but I need just one more part. We're making this a three-part series because we're at 19 minutes, and me talking right now is going to shoot us right over 20 minutes. So I need to end things here, and I will cover the firmware in the next video, as well as some other key aspects for maintaining and tuning this board. It's a pretty involved topic, so I just want to make sure everything is crystal clear, and if anything changes making my video obsolete, I can simply re-upload that instead of an entire build video, which is easier to manage. Thank you all for watching. It's been really cool having everyone share builds in the Discord server, so definitely keep that up. With that all being said, I'll see you all in the next video. Bye for now.